Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We read about the creation of all things. One of the first things that's mentioned as far as that which is in the created order is mentioned in verse 2. Look at Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. Moses writes by inspiration and he says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Hovering over the face of the waters. We want to talk about water tonight and how important water is. It's such a very important blessing in our life. One of the first things that we head to when we wake up in the morning is to the restroom, most likely, to get some water. Either to wash our face, to bathe our body, we get a drink of water to, to quench our thirst. We rely so much, as uh, our life depends so much upon this creation of God known as water. Water is the very foundation of all life on earth. It's been called the, the lifeblood of our planet. Very, the very existence of life depends on water. What is the very first thing a space probe looks for when it goes to another heavenly body, whether it be to Mars or some other planet? It's looking for water. Looking for water. Because scientists know that water is essential to life. Consider your own human body. 25% of the human body is solid matter, whereas 75% of your body is water. The brain is said to be 85% water. Human blood is 90% water. Muscles are 75% water. The liver is 82% water, and our bones of our body are 22% water. Every part of the human body is dependent on this creation of God known as water. And as we have already said, without water there is no life. Also, when you think of water in our physical world, you see that water defines boundaries. Many states in the United States of America are divided by rivers. That is the line of demarcation from one state to the next state. A river will divide the states, even countries. The United States is divided from Mexico by a river. It defines boundaries. When you're looking out over a horizon, when you're looking out over a body of water, whether it be a sea or an ocean, you see definite boundary lines. There is a boundary line between the body of water and the sky. And when you're looking down at the shore, there is a boundary line between where the land ends and that body of water begins. There is boundaries there. Water is a blessing, as I said before. It's a creation of God. It's a blessing for our planet. It's been used for so much good, yet it also has been used for so much evil. Many murders have taken place in water as people will drown other people in that terrible act of murder. So water can be a source of good and it can be used as a source of evil. But water is very important. And then let's look through the Bible and see how that God has used this substance that He created as an act of blessing upon His people. Consider Genesis chapter 6 through 9. You remember how mankind began to populate upon the face of the earth. They became very, very wicked. Wherein you only found Noah and his family to be faithful. 
it grieved God that He had even created the human race. And He determined that He was going to destroy the world with water. He was going to use the very substance that He created to maintain life on this planet. And He was going to use it as an instrument of destruction and judgment on this planet. We know the story. God told Noah to build an ark. Noah obeyed God, his family, and two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal went upon the ark. And we know from Matthew chapter 24, verses 38 through 39, as Jesus is looking back on the flood, he said, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, verse 39, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus here is contrasting His coming at the end of time, which will destroy the world, with the destruction of the world in the flood. He said it came upon them in an unexpected manner. Life went on as usual. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Then the flood came. Christ is saying that's how it will be at the end of time. Life will go on as normal, as usual, and then I will return. But the flood came and destroyed the world. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. Peter tells us that God did not spare the ancient world. Talking about the world before the flood. But saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. Peter again says, the world that then existed, talking about that ancient world, perished. That word means was destroyed, being flooded with water. And God used that element that He created to be a blessing for mankind as an instrument of judgment on His creation. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. Peter says the divine long-suffering, talking about God's long-suffering, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So that same element that was used to destroy the ancient world and destroy the rest of humanity was the same element that was used to rescue or save Noah and everyone on the ark. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to this. So God used water to destroy the entire planet. And through that water, He saved eight souls and preserved them alive. We wouldn't be here talking about it today if that had not happened. Consider the Red Sea as we're talking about water. Exodus Chapters 13 and 14. Think about how God chose Moses to be the one who would rescue, would deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Pharaoh finally conceded to let the people go after ten plagues ravaged his empire. They were there at the Red Sea and then Pharaoh once again hardened his heart and went after the children of Israel and was once again going to enslave them, or at least kill them, punish them for what had happened. And so you had the children of Israel up against the Red Sea, and here you have the armies of the Egyptians coming after them. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Now notice, Moses is saying here, this is the salvation of the Lord. This is God's salvation. God is going to save you from this army of the Egyptians that's coming. Of course, we know the story. We know how God split open that great Red Sea. And allowed the children of Israel as a nation to march on dry ground. They reached the other side. 
Then the Egyptian army came in after them. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 28. It says, The waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. The walls of water that God held up by His mighty power, He caused to collapse down upon the Egyptian army. Verse 29 says, But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Verse 30, So the Lord saved, notice this, the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. It was the salvation of the Lord, and the Lord saved them, but He used the instrumentality of water. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul, looking back on this very event, said this, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our ancestors were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. The cloud that he is referring to is that cloud, the, the manifestation of God's presence that guided Israel as they were going to go into the wilderness wanderings. And so that was the presence of God. And they all passed through the sea. That's talking about the Red Sea. Verse 2, all were baptized or immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were surrounded by one side and by the other, by water, and that cloud the manifestation of God's presence was above them, and so they were immersed, as it were, when they passed through the Red Sea. Think about the Jordan River as we think about water. Second Kings chapter 5. A lot is said in the Bible about the River Jordan. We sing songs about the River Jordan as we symbolically view that river as that river that will take us to the next life as we pass through the Jordan to go on into the spirit realm, symbolically speaking. Second Kings chapter 5, you have a commander of the Syrian army. Second Kings 5 and verse 1. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria, he also was a mighty man of valor, but a leper. He was a mighty warrior, a commander of the army of Syria, but he had leprosy. That was an, 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 an incurable disease that he could not get rid of. There's no way he could. The little servant girl that he had was from Israel and said, If only my master knew about the man of God, referring to Elisha. She knew that God through him could heal him. So Naaman went down to Elisha's house. Look at verse 9. 2 Kings 5 and verse 9. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Verse 10, And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Here's what you do. You go wash or you dip seven times in the Jordan River, and your leprosy will be cleansed. Verse 11, but Naaman was furious at that. And went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me, stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. He was looking for Elisha to do some sort of performance. And Naaman thought, this is how it should be. But the way people think is not always the way God does things. Verse 12, Are not Abna and far part of the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He said, there's better rivers in Damascus I can go wash in. Why should I go to the Jordan? It's not a very clean river. 
Verse 13, but his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So the servant goes to uh, Naaman and talks him into it, says, here's what you need to do. You need to go ahead and do it. If, if, if he would have told you to do something great, would you not have done it? This is something very simple. Verse 14, so he went down to the Jordan. He went down and he dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, Elisha, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. God used the instrumentality of water to bring about a cleansing in Naaman. Now, God could have cleansed Naaman on the spot, just like that. No problem. He didn't have to use water, but he did. And Naaman finally conceded and by faith went to the Jordan and dipped, immersed himself seven times. And after that seventh time he came up and his leprosy was totally gone. And it so impressed that pagan uh, commander, verse 15 says, he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. That so impressed him that this man who no doubt probably believed in many gods before this time was convinced there's no other God but the God of Israel. And was willing to give a gift to Elisha. God used the instrumentality of water. Nothing special about the water in the Jordan. Nothing at all. But God said to do it. And when Naaman did it, he came up cleansed. God used that instrumentality. Think about the pool of Siloam. Is our scripture reading. John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. In many ways, Jesus performed miracles. Sometimes He would lay hands on people and heal them. There were times that He healed people from a distance. Didn't even touch them. Didn't even see them. So he had the ability to perform any miracle in any way he so chose. He does something unusual here. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. The Apostle John records for us. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. So this man was born blind. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It was the common thought of the day that if you were born with a defect, with an ailment, that your parents must have sinned to cause you to be born that way. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the, the works of God should be revealed in him. Verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And he is the light spiritually to the world. But quite literally, he is going to open the eyes of this man who had been born blind so that light literally could come into him. Verse 6, and when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay, clay from the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So he spit on the ground made clay, anointed the blind man's eyes with the clay. Verse 7, And said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now Christ didn't have to do it that way. He didn't even have to touch him. He did not have to even say a word. And the man could have been healed of his blindness. But he chose this way of doing it for whatever reason, we're not told. But he told him, you go down, after he anointed his eyes with the clay that he had made, you go down to the pool of Siloam and you wash yourself. And then you will come back seeing. Christ 
used the instrumentality of water to bring about this man's healing and healed him through this method. What's the point to all this? Why are we talking about how important water is? Well, just as we had talked about how important water is and how essential it is to biological life, water is essential to spiritual life. It's essential to spiritual life. Water baptism is that doorway into which we receive the forgiveness of sins and all the spiritual blessings that are found only in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. God chose that medium. God chose that instrumentality of water by which we become His children. By which we are born again. John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Jesus is talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus. He is a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. He came to uh, Jesus by night in verse 2. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know that God is working through you. You are a teacher come from God. Because we see the miracles you perform, and no one can do that unless God is with him. Nicodemus was one of the honest Pharisees. He looked at the evidence and said, this man is from God. He's got to be. Jesus got right to the heart of the matter, verse 3, and he answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just talk about being born again. He goes on to elaborate it. Elaborate on it. Because Nicodemus in verse 4 says, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Maybe some sort of reincarnation Nicodemus is thinking of. Verse 5, But Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water. That substance that we talked about in Genesis chapter 1 that he created that is very essential to our our biological existence. We could not live without it. Jesus is saying that very substance is essential for us to enter in to the kingdom of God. You have to be born again, Nicodemus. You have to be born again of water and the Spirit. The Spirit, through the Gospel, is what teaches us about the plan of salvation. Because the Gospel is God's power to save. Romans 1 and verse 16. And in that Gospel plan of salvation, we learn about water. It is essential for a person to make that transition from the world, from darkness, into light, into the kingdom. Remember what we talked about earlier about how water defines boundaries? Water baptism is that boundary between the world being lost, being in a state of condemnation, to being justified, sanctified, cleansed, purified, made a child of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 through 22. Remember I said we're going back to this passage. 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 20 through 22. As Peter was talking about the divine long suffering waiting in the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, notice this, were saved through water. That same substance that God used to destroy the earth, He used as the instrumentality to save Noah and those on the ark. It was through water they were saved. Then Peter, by inspiration, draws a parallel. He says, verse 21, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. It's an antitype to the type. The type is the flood. The antitype is water baptism. 
Verse 21, he goes on to elaborate and say, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not an outward cleansing. But it's the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You tie that in with Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We're baptized into His death. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Christ, verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to Him. Without Jesus Christ, water baptism means nothing. We're not talking about baptism alone. But we're talking about baptism as being that line of demarcation in which a person makes that transition from being lost to being saved. That's why in Acts chapter 10, verse 47 and 48, when God sent His Holy Spirit upon the household of Cornelius to prove that God would accept Gentiles if they would obey the Gospel. He would accept them into His kingdom. Peter says, Can anyone forbid water? That these should not be baptized or immersed who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Notice, they received the Holy Spirit. They did not receive salvation. They received the Holy Spirit because this was a special case in which the Holy Spirit was signifying these would be accepted if they obey the Gospel. Verse 48, And He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked Him to stay a few days. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. You tie that in with Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. That baptism in the name of the Lord, when it's with someone who is repenting, is for the forgiveness of sins. And also that person receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Water. You can't live without it. Water. You can't live spiritually without it. That doesn't mean water is the Savior. Not at all. That means the Savior said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be condemned. That's what the Savior said about water. You have to be born again of water and the Spirit or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Water, we must have it if we're going to live and we must have it if we're going to live spiritually. That's the will of God. There's anyone here tonight who has not been baptized properly. You have not been baptized according to what the Bible says. We urge you to make that change today. Believe in Christ, confess Him as the Son of God, repent of your sins, and be immersed in water. And let God cleanse you through the blood of His Son. Revelation 1 and verse 5. If you've done that and gone astray, repent and come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.